It's my pleasure to welcome Murray Gunn to the show. He is head of global research at Elliott Wave International, and he is a lead contributor to deflation.com. Now, these guys have been saying deflation for quite a while. Are they right or are they wrong? I don't know. It's mixed, right? Because uh, deflation and inflation, that's always uh, much more opaque than it might seem. It's uneven. Everybody has their own personal inflation and deflation rate, depending on their spending. And of course, we see a lot of, uh, a lot of unevenness here. So we'll talk about that as, as well as a bunch of other things as we dive into the famous Elliott Wave theory today. Murray, welcome. How are you? Uh, thank you, Jason. I'm very well, thank you. Indeed. Good. It's good to have you. And uh, tell our uh, viewers and listeners where you're located. So I'm located in uh, Essex, which is just east of uh, the great city of London here in uh, the United Kingdom. Excellent, excellent, good stuff. And by the way, if you're watching this on our YouTube channel, please post your uh, comments down below and we will try and address those uh, as soon as possible. If we don't address them uh, quickly, we will address them on future episodes. So we, we always read all of those and we love your comments and questions. And, you know, if you agree or if you disagree, you know, comment down below and let us know what you think. And um, uh, let's go ahead and dive in. So we've got some slides to look at with some charts and graphs. And for those of you who are listening on the audio only versions, we will try and illuminate these slides for you. But you can always uh, see more at our YouTube channel. Murray, it's all yours. Well, thank you, Jason. So the, the first slide uh, I've got here is just a, a very short introduction to the Elliott Wave principle. So here's a picture of the man himself, uh, Ralph Elliott. And um, so the Elliott Wave principle is, is a model of the economy, a model of the stock market and the economy uh, discovered by Ralph Elliott in the 1930s. And what he uh, discovered was that um, human herding behavior drives the stock market in certain identifiable and repeatable patterns. And that these patterns are repeated uh, over the very short term to the very long term. So what that means is that it's uh, potentially uh, able, to for able to forecast human herding behavior uh, into the future. And so what this chart shows here is that uh, of the, the stylized uh, model of the uh, Elliott Wave uh, principle. And what it really describes is, is a progression in the stock market, a five wave up, three wave down progression. Uh, and the most important thing that uh, Elliott discovered was that the, the cycles repeat at every time scale. So what he discovered was that the, the stock market is a fractal something that was, that was proven uh, decades later by uh, Benoit Mandelbrot. But um, this is important because it means that although the stock market goes up over the very long term, it can have periods of uh, setback which can last uh, quite a number of years. Okay, and it, expand on what fractal means. When you say it's, a, it's really a fractal, what do you mean by that? So each pattern is a subset of a, of a larger pattern. So if we can see on this stylized diagram here, that on the left-hand side, if, I, if you can see my cursor here, this wave one above the five circle, that wave one consists of uh, five waves in circles, one, two, three, four, five. But if you look at that fifth wave there, that itself consists of five waves, one, two, three, four, five in brackets. So each pattern is a subset of a smaller and a larger pattern. Uh, and that, that's, the reason for that is because the stock market is driven by human herding behavior, and, and those cycles repeat at every time scale. Okay, so let's expand on the human herding behavior comment. So um, when Robert Prechter uh, was on the show years ago, uh, he was the first Elliott Wave person I interviewed. He talked about how people, uh, you know, everybody is a player in the marketplace, we're all players in the economy, and we go out and we talk to people, we share our emotions, and that actually cycles back in a feedback loop uh, to actually, uh, you know, we of course react to the market, but then we act upon the market. Would that be a fair way to say it? Yes, I, I think so, absolutely. It's, uh, it's, it's unconscious uh, herding behavior. We don't actually realize we're doing it as groups. Uh, as, as individuals, we think we're rational, but um, anyone who's been to a pop concert or a, a football match, sporting occasion, you get carried away with the crowd. And it's exactly the same thing 
that happens in the financial markets. Okay, good, good. Now take us to the next uh, chart. Okay, so with that, with that in mind, that uh, design in mind, he, he, here's our thesis of uh, what we think is happening at the moment. And this is, shows uh, the very long-term chart of the Dow and what we've labeled super cycle waves four and five. So this was 1929, we had the crash uh, in what we're labeling uh, super cycle degree wave four into 19, the 1932 low. So everything from 1932 has been um, a series of waves. And we think that now uh, what we call cycle degree wave five of super cycle degree wave five is um, coming to uh, an end. Uh, and in fact, it looks like this year could have been uh, the, the actual end of, of that, uh, that cycle. So um, we think that the, the stock market is due, uh, could be due a, a correction which could last for some time based on, on this analysis of the, the long-term patterns in, in the Dow Jones Industrial Average. Okay, but this chart is uneven, right? It, it shows a peak in 1929, it goes down for the Great Depression, it comes back uh, in 1937, it's come back, you know, substantially, but it's still not at its prior peak. Then, you know, 1966, you also highlight, uh, then it sort of levels off, goes up and up and up pretty much till 2000. And then, you know, it's down, dot com bubble bust, uh, you know, it's up for a while, the Great Recession hits, the global financial crisis goes down, and then it's been up, up, up since then. Um, why do you think we're at the end of a cycle now? I mean, look, it's, this conversation gets pretty complicated when you put a pandemic in the mix, uh, because that's a, you know, a black swan event, I'd say, Nassim Nicholas Taleb, uh, or Nicholas Nassim Taleb, he says it's a white swan event, but whatever, it's a swan. <laughs> it's an unusual event, um, and no one expected it. Uh, so why, why does this chart show us that we're due for a correction? I mean, we've already had a correction. And then, of course, the Fed and, you know, various central banks and governments around the world stepped in and you know, overcame the, the correction, but with artificial stimulus, but yeah, this stuff's so complicated. <laughs> well, it's, it's based on the Elliott wave um, structure that, that we see. And, and there isn't just some subjective structure that are rules and guidelines that Elliott identified to wave formation. Okay. And if we uh, adhere to those rules and guidelines, then looking at this chart, uh, this is a potential structure. There are other structures as well. This is one potential structure, which we think is the most probable at the moment. And one of the reasons uh, because of that is uh, that we think it's most probable is because of things we'll come on to later in the slides. Um, there's been a huge buildup in debt. And this is one of the reasons why we think that deflation is the, is the bigger risk. Now, um, so does debt cause deflation? Is that a is that a premise of the Elliott Wave philosophy? Yes, a buildup of debt is is, is the precursor to, to deflation. Um, Why? You know, well, because it's, it's uh, you have to have a debt inflated first, um, and then it is deflated. The, the the mistake that almost everyone makes is that we we think we've been conditioned as a society to think of inflation and deflation as uh, rising and falling prices of consumer prices. It's not. In monetary economics, inflation and deflation refer to the expansion and contraction of money and credit in an economy, and, and credit is debt. So um, every, there was a, a, a Elliott Wave expert and friend of Elliott, uh, a man called Hamilton Bolton, who uh, founded the bank credit analyst uh, way back in the 1940s. And he did a study of the major depressions in the US going back centuries. And he found that every major uh, depression was um, a precursor to that was a, was a big buildup in, in debt. And interestingly, you, you mentioned about the pandemic. The one thing that he um, noticed from all the, that historical research was that the, the problem, the debt problem seems to um, be, seems to be burst or come on the depression seems to come on suddenly. And it seems 
a lot of people, a lot of times it, it, it has been at the time to pe people think that it's because of a, an outside event. So what we're, what's happening now could well fit that, that sort of model. Okay, so the debt uh, causes inflation and then eventually the debt bubble burst causing deflation. Is that the theory? That's correct. As the, okay. as the, as the economy so, contracts, people pay back debt uh, or go bankrupt and that creates a spiral. Okay, a deflationary spiral, right? Yes. Got it. Okay, so how do we know though, because we always have debt in the system, how do we know at what point that debt becomes and I'm going to do air quotes here for those who can't see too much, <laughs> right? Like, where is the number? Where is the metric for the amount of debt? I mean, how do we know that the amount of debt now is too much, or maybe it can be double this amount? And of course, we're talking about, uh, pub is it public and private debt? I guess it's probably just all debt, right? Or, or is there some distinction there you want us to know? Well, again, well, we're, there's a, a slide later on, we can talk about the distinction between public and private, but it, uh, I'll, the main um, thing to, to look at is the private sector debt. And private sector debt, as with everything, everything relies on confidence. And this is what the Elliott Wave principle, looking at the stock market, is measuring. We're, we are measuring confidence. And so when the cycle looks like it's topping out as it does now, it's suggesting that confidence is, uh, is, on, the, is on the wane. And uh, when that happens, of course, people will just, for a start, they probably won't want to borrow. We've seen uh, the savings ratio go up. Uh, we'll, we'll have, people won't want to lend as well. And so that behavioral change uh, feeds on itself and then it starts to uh, bring into more of a, what we call a negative social mood. Uh, and that itself starts to uh, make confidence disappear. Okay. So when I look at this chart, and we'll move on after this, okay, I don't want to belabor this point too much. Sure. But when I look at this chart, I see 1966, which is the third wave, right? Mm -hmm. And then I see things sort of ultimately just level off until that looks like about, I don't know what, 1978? What, it doesn't say the year there, so, you know. Where, where I've labeled wave two here is 1982. Yeah. Okay, um, 19, 1982, okay. Yeah. So to 1982, then overall, it's a steady climb up, 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 up until 2000, mm -hmm. right? Now the Delta, so that's quite a few years, that's 28 years, or sorry, 18 years, right? Okay. Yeah. So that upswing is much uh, longer in time and higher in, in breadth than the one we've had since the Great Recession. And you're, you're looking at 2009 as the bottom, right? So we haven't had as long a run yet as that. Yeah. Uh, and, and here, by the way, we're talking about the Dow Jones Industrial Average, okay? The mm. DJIA, okay? So why would it indicate we're due? I mean, shouldn't it you know, just by looking at a chart only, shouldn't it just go longer? And then before we have our correction? Well, that, that's a great point. And that speaks very much to the one of the most important rules of that Elliot had discovered in his in his study of the stock market. What tends to happen in what we call an impulse wave is that wave three, the third wave, um, very, very often tends to be the longest wave of the structure. So you have uh, out, of the th out of a five wave up move, you have wave one, three, and five. Wave three very often is the, is the longest and strongest wave of that. Wave five, on the other hand, tends to be uh, uh, a little bit weaker, uh, perhaps sh uh, shorter, um, and there are underlying uh, issues with the fifth wave in terms of breadth, in terms of the actual strength, the underlying strength of the wave, which we can identify um, a, a, as well. So it makes sense from, a, from an Elliott wave standpoint that the fifth wave here since 2009 is, uh, is shorter on this log chart than, um, than the, the, the third wave from um, 1982 to 2000. Okay, and since we're only talking about the Dow Jones Industrial Average, are, are we 
I mean, is the Elliott wave uh, philosophy saying that this is the economy, that the economy tracks the Dow Jones, or is the economy separate from the stock chart? Well, the, the, the economy is, uh, is a lead indicator of, uh, the, sorry, the, the stock market is a lead indicator of the uh, economy. Okay. Uh, and I've had this argument for years with economists I used to work with in, in, a, in my previous life. And um, you know, one of them actually proved it to himself when an econometric model, uh, econometric model, sorry. Um, if the stock market isn't a lead indicator of the economy, why does the OECD use it as one of their leading indicators? And it's a leading indicator of the economy because it, everything gets down to confidence. I mean, people that feel confident, what do they do? They go out and they buy stocks, first of all. And then, and then after that, they might open a factory or open a new office and then hire people. So, but the first thing they do is buy stocks or if they're feeling not very confident, they will sell stocks. So that's why the stock market leads the economy. The Dow has the, has the best uh, you know, price history, but um, you know, the, it is also the, the, the sentimental leader uh, of, of price. You know, the Dow is, is, is all over the news uh, uh, and everyone's consciousness throughout the world. Okay. Um, and that's why uh, it's an important index to look at. Okay, good. Let's move on. Okay, so that was, that was, um, so I uh, need to watch out for the delay there, but that's, uh, that's the big picture. And then if we look at the, the, the shorter term, so this would be up here, if you can see the cursor, this would be the, the high this year on, on February the 12th. And what we're looking at here is what's happened in, in the crash in February and March. We can subdivide that into uh, five waves and we're labeling that as wave one in a in circle. And then since March, we've had um, a three wave movement labeled A, B and C into the June the 8th high. And we label that as wave two uh, at this juncture. So what that means is that the next movement in the stock market over the next few months according to this analysis, and if it's correct, then it will mean that the Dow and, and other stock markets as well, obviously, will fall uh, over the next few months in, in what, what would be wave three. Okay. Now, now, allied to that chart, I'll just move on to the next one. This is really, really interesting because um, the stock market this year fell off a high. It came right off a, a high point, and, and that... When that happens in the Elliott Wave uh, model, it, it tells us that there's, there's more to come um, because it will just be the first wave of, of a movement. Now, on the left-hand side here, you can see what happened uh, in the, the Wall Street crash in uh, 1929. So um, we had that um, fall in the Wall Street crash uh, in, in 1929. Then it made a low in November 1929. It actually rallied, the Dow actually rallied by, by 52% um, from 1929 to November 1929 to April 1930. And at that time, just like now, everyone thought that the economy was back on track. Uh, so you had a multi-month um, rally in the market and everyone thought, okay, we've had the crash, everything's hunky-dory, everything's fine. What's really interesting is that in this year's crash, we had the crash in, in February and March, now, the Dow in, has retraced more than the crash this, this time round, but it's really interesting that it's actually in an, a, a nominal return from its low has, from the uh, March 23rd low to the June the 8th high, has rallied by 51.43%, which is astonishingly close to what happened in November 1929 to April 1930. And so, you know, that's why we label potentially, this is where we are right here um, at the moment. So it's, uh, it's a very interesting juncture to be at uh, at the moment. Okay. So, uh, so it, how, how much correction are we looking at in the Dow Jones? Well, uh, obviously from April 1930 into the low in 1932, it lost uh, more than 80% of its value. Right. Now, now, just because this has happened here, uh, that doesn't mean that we're going to lose automatically 80% of the value of the Dow over the next uh, two years. But 
what we're identifying is that that's the direction of travel at mm -hmm. the moment and we just need to see how how the waves uh, progress certainly given the the bigger picture chart that we showed a couple of charts ago um it would suggest that the correction could be quite severe is there any way for elliott wave to evaluate the um amount or or the impact of government uh participation in the market i mean the biggest bond investor on planet earth is the federal reserve how do you <laughs> how do you account for that i mean i know we're not talking about bonds right now but it's all tied together as we know sure well you know government is the is the ultimate uh and, and that's you know, not the government by the way exactly of course we know the federal reserve is private but you get what i'm saying the powers sure, that yeah, be yeah. you know yes the unholy alliance between governments and central banks <laughs> yes <laughs> Uh, well, th there's uh, government and the public sector, let's call them, they, they tend to be the, the, the sort of ultimate crowd. So they're always last to the party, uh, if you like. So, um, and yes, you know, they, 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 they are feel uh, obligated to try and keep things uh, ticking over. Uh, what's interesting is that, uh, you know, when you talk to people and you think about central banks and and we've been, again, we've been conditioned to think of the omnipotence, omnipotence of, of central banks, that they can do no wrong. And of course, you know, after this rally, we've seen, uh, we've, we've seen some of the central banks, particularly the Bank of England here in, in the UK, they've been saying, oh, well, we've saved the economy again. So, um, you know, they just continually th will throw money at the problem um, and, and continually to add debt upon debt. But what they are, um, forgetting is that everything relies on confidence and they were allowed to be seen as the victors in the great financial crisis 10 years ago this time around given the Elliott wave structure we think it might be a little bit different and if if what's coming now is a third wave we would not be surprised at all if if faith and confidence in central banks particularly the fed started to wane um you know if you can imagine uh if the stock market started to come off and the Fed started to, to throw even more money at the problem and it still started to, to then it still continued to, to, to fall, then confidence would, would quite very quickly disappear. And that's what, that's the power of the Elliott wave principle is that we can actually anticipate events like that happening because the, the price structure tends to lead the, the, the events in that regard. Okay. Now this chart here, uh, it is very interesting. Um, uh, Davos is the uh, meeting every January in, in, in Davos in Switzerland for the World it's, Economic It's on Forum. my bucket list. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, really interesting. Uh, in, in, in the history of Davos, there's only been ever two uh, sitting US presidents that have attended Davos. Uh, the first one was Bill Clinton uh, in January 2000 right at the very end of the big bull market in the 1990s mm -hmm. uh, and so what's interesting about it is of course that davos tends to be a bit of a boondoggle a bit of a uh, a, 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 a forum where people can show off and take credit for things right so that's obviously perhaps what clinton was doing back in 2000 the market started to came off pretty severely obviously as the dot-com bubble burst after that the only other sitting U.S. president to have gone to Davos is, is the President Trump uh, at the moment. And, and this chart shows that he went um, you know, back here in, in 2018 after the market had, had rallied a lot. Subsequently to that, the market fell. Now, but interestingly, after the, after the market had fallen, uh, you know, the next year, uh, Mr. Trump decided not to go to Davos. After the market rallied into uh, into th this year, he, he did attend again, and so it seems that uh, President Trump is a bit of a sentiment indicator for the uh, stock market. Now, what's interesting again is that after the the amazing payroll report uh, of uh, last month, and I noticed it again, he did it again today, was uh, Mr. Trump uh, was uh, eager to take credit for it and and, and say that it was the greatest comeback in American history. But what's fascinating is that just after he said that, the market topped. And, and so, you know, the, um, it's going to be really interesting to see if the market does fall from here because uh, uh, hubris uh, uh, and boasting 
tends to be uh, a feature of um, any stock market rally. Um, you know, it, it happens uh, no matter whether you're the president of the United States or, you know, someone sitting in Essex in England. If, if you're feeling good about it, you want to take credit for it. If you're feeling bad about it, you don't want to do anything about it. And, 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 but this shows graphically just a, an interesting aspect of what's happening. Yeah. Um, Murray, um, there uh, must be a cord or something that is uh, somehow affiliated with your sound, and uh, it's sort of moving around. If if you can, uh, it's right. only doing it sometimes, but we definitely are hearing that noise and picking that up. Um, okay, let's uh, go ahead. So yeah, the president indicator. I mean, I don't know. You know, it's there's so much other stuff going on in the world. You know, maybe sure. that's a small thing, but uh, it's sort of interesting. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it, it, it ties in with the, the, the wave count, which is, which is interesting. Now, this chart it, here, The question is causation or correlation, right? But yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Well, exactly. And that, that, that's a great, a great point. We think that everyone um, gets the causality of things uh, the wrong way around. Um, socioeconomics is uh, Robert Prechter's uh, hypothesis that it's uh, social mood that causes social actions, whereas people tend to think that it's social actions that cause social mood. So if you think about it, uh, most people would think that um, uh, recession, or biz, or recessions cause business people to be cautious. From a socioeconomic point of view, we would say that it's actually cautious business people that cause recessions. Um, so that, that, that's the way we think about causality. Now this chart here, is, um, you know, I, I don't think anyone can look at this chart and say that the, the, the stock market is not overvalued. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's, and by it's the way, you're not getting any argument from me on that. I may have sounded like I thought it wasn't overvalued earlier, but I, I don't disagree. So go ahead. Yeah. Sure. Um, you know, it's, um, we don't normally like to be put in the same, in the same bucket as uh, Warren Buffett. Um, because he looks at things from a, a, a different point of view from we do, but this is his chart. This is what he looks at in terms of valuation. And um, yeah, we can see that uh, from a valuation point of view that the market is absolutely uh, ripe for a, a, a big fall. Uh, and it's interesting that it ties in with what the Elliott Wave principle is saying. Uh, okay, so, so let's see what we're looking at here. So we've got this, uh, this chart with uh, blue on the bottom and red on the top, and the red parts are kind of indicating peaks uh, or overvalued uh, markets, I guess. So in 1971, uh, so what are we looking at? U.S. stock market valuation, the Wilshire 5000 versus GDP. And like you said, that is what Warren Buffett looks at. He looks at the market versus GDP. But does he use the Wilshire 5000 or the S&P? I believe he uses the the... the a number of measures, but yeah. the, the broadest market measure would be would be the best, and and the right. um, and and so yeah. this is the broader, yeah. Yes, yeah. This okay. would take into account. Okay, yeah. so so you've got 1971. Um, you know, it's a it's a little bit overvalued. I mean, what is this? What are these percentages? What do they mean? So uh, so this is the percentage, the, the stock market valuation as a percent of gross domestic product. Ah, uh, got it, got product. it. Okay, so so here. The stock market valuation versus GDP is 80%. It's 80%. The stock market in 1971, the stock market was 80% of the economy. And then in 1982, it was down towards the 30% of the economy. When, when uh, interestingly enough... Okay, so you're, take, you're taking the market cap of the stock market, of the indice, the index, which is here, the Wilshire 5000. So the market cap of the Wilshire 5000 in 1971 was 80% of the GDP of the country. Yes. Right, got it, okay. So then, uh, you know, through the 80s, it was uh, much lower. It got, uh, kind of got up to like 60% at one point there uh, in 89. And so then uh, by 2000, as the dot-com bubble was bursting, we were at about 140% of GDP. And yes. then 2007, we're at about 100% of GDP. Uh, 2009, it's way down. It's back down to like, well, maybe 55, 60% of GDP. And now we're at 180% of GDP. Wow. Yes. 
Yeah. Yes, in, 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 indeed. Now, what's interesting, I just point out uh, to, on this chart, is that in 1982, back here when it was about 30% of GDP, uh, hardly uh, hardly anybody was was, was bullish. Um, but one person who was bullish was Robert Presser because he was looking at the market from an Elliott Wave principle point of view. Um, uh, and he was in very much in the minority there, but obviously that turned out to be uh, a great level to be entering the, the market from at, at that right. point. But by, now, by the way, I do, I do want to mention one thing, um, just uh, so our listeners and viewers know, um, you know, Harry Dent, who's been on the show several times, and he's actually speaking at our upcoming Meet the Masters conference, which 22nd anniversary, first time we're doing it virtually. <laughs> so we'll, we'll see. But, but Harry Dent is speaking there. And, and he's a big fan of Elliott Wave. And he, I believe he and Robert Prechter are friends, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. Just wanted to kind of tie those two together because a lot of people follow Harry Dent's work. Right. Yes. Well, you know, it's, uh, it's the exact opposite now, obviously. Um, and so it's another reason to think that the market's uh, set for uh, a fall. Right. Okay, good. Uh, should, are we finished with this chart? Yeah. Okay. okay. So, so let's, now, let's, yeah. So th th this chart, we talked about, uh, talked about debt being a problem and, and this is just a, a, a measurement of debt and this is non-financial uh, corporate debt as a percent of GDP. And the shaded lines show where a US recession has occurred. Um, and it's generally after debt has been built up, which ties in with what Hamilton Bolton was talking about you get the buildup of debt, then you have the debt deflation as the economy uh, contracts. Now, because uh, debt has been built up to such an extent now, and this is just one measurement, of course, we've got many other measurements that we could look at in terms of personal debt uh, as well. Derivatives are, derivatives are just another debt. They're just an IOU, um, which are obviously uh, insanely high uh, at the moment. Um, but this non-financial corporate debt is, is definitely one stark measurement of how much debt has, has been driven up. Right. Um, but the, prem the premise of that debt argument, which is what we were touching on earlier, is that the debt has to stop. There has to be, it, you know, it has to be that game of musical chairs where the music stops and someone's left standing, right? If, if they keep pumping the debt, if, if, you know, th there, there is money to borrow, then this can keep going until there isn't money to borrow. You have to have a collapse in the debt market for the debt argument to work because it's all a matter of degree, right? You know, it, it's, it's not really the buildup of debt, it's the assumption that the debt will stop, that people will not be able, people, countries, governments will not be able to take on further debt, corporations too, of course. Um, you know, that, that's the thing, that's the underlying premise of this whole thing. Because if you can keep borrowing, then the bubble just inflates further, right? Absolutely, and that, that's a great point because it, 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 it takes us into, and what we talked about earlier, the difference between private sector and, and public sector debt, uh, and so, just moving on to this slide, this is what happened in uh, Japan. So the Japanese uh, bubble burst at the end of the uh, 1980s. Uh, and as you can see, um, this is Japanese private sector debt as a percentage of GDP. So from the early 1990s, the private sector debt in Japan was deflating. Okay, and it was deflating for decades. And it's still deflating. It's still it's been deflating. Public sector debt in Japan has gone the other way. And this is what we're seeing as a microcosm uh, just in the last few weeks, uh, months now, um, of what's happening now. And, and what we think is the start of a new trend is that, is that public sector debt is exploding, um, but private sector debt is beginning to show signs of contracting. And we think this is, a, this is the, the trend of deflation that will happen in uh, Western economies, particularly the US, uh, just like it happened in Japan. Now, you know, so Japan has gone through a period of, of debt deflation over the last few decades. And um, Japan hasn't disappeared as a country. It's, it's, it's functioned as an economy. Um, it hasn't gone through any uh, Great Depression-esque type of 
environment. It's just muddled along with very much subpar growth. And um, because confidence disappears, and when confidence disappears, private sector debt starts to deflate. And so the public sector debt can, can continue to inflate as much as it wants, um, but it's the private sector which is the important thing. If we look back to, to the Great Depression in, in the 1930s, we had um, uh, FDR's New Deal. Now, the New Deal works program, all the, pub, all the public debt that was thrown at um, the economy, uh, started in 1933, but by 1942, the economy was pretty much the same as it was in 1933. So the, 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 the public sector debt really, and, 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 and if it's employed in public works, it doesn't really have much effect in the economy. In fact, in Japan, of course, they were building uh, during that time, during the last few decades, they've been building roads literally to nowhere uh, in order to keep people employed. And so, you know, this might be what's happening there. Right. But, but as Harry Dent likes to say, and I agree with him, by the way, on this one, I don't agree with him on some things, but uh, Japan has a demographics problem. I mean, it's got a giant demographics problem. It has demographic deflation. If you don't have people, you can't have an economy. And in 50 to 70 years, you're not going to have a country. I mean, literally, Japan will cease to exist via depopulation. That country will just disappear from the earth. It, you can't have a country without people. You know, that's, yeah. But uh, that's, yes, very, very true. Um, but it, and, 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 and you don't have those younger workers coming into the system paying for the older people. And, you know, so yeah, it's, uh, that's a really weird problem Japan has. But, uh, but what about the, the savings rate? Um, you know, we talked about debt and we see the savings rate actually going up, which should be a good thing. But all the Keynesians say, go out and spend money, right? <laughs> so, right. you know, you would think, you would think, uh, hey, you know, savings, oh, there you go. Uh, right. Savings, uh, savings, you've got to have savings uh, and capital formation to create wealth. That's the foundation of any wealth creation of any household, any economy, any country, right? Of course, um, absolutely. Um, you know, savings, uh, a savings rate, and this is the chart of the US uh, personal savings rate, uh, reflect confidence, consumer confidence, and, re and it reflects um, you know, business confidence as well. Um, but what's interesting here is that obviously the savings rate has, has, has exploded higher uh, this year, up to about 13% in, in the first quarter. And of course, everyone at the time when, when they saw this going up, said, everyone was rubbing their hands. This is fantastic. What, there's going to be a, a mountain of cash ready to be deployed in the stock market, and it's all going to be invested, and everything's going to be fine. Well, Perhaps, uh, but what's interesting is if you look at the history of the savings rate, you know you can see that actually a savings rate, when it was down here in the in the 1990s and in the early noughties, uh, of you know six percent or below, that was the abnormality. Having a savings rate up here is normal. If we look back to to see what happened in what we call cycle wave four, uh, in that very first chart that we we showed. So there's the, the, the sideways bear market in the, in the, in the economy, in the Dow, the, the savings rate averaged around 12% during those years. So, you know, a 13% at the moment is not unusual at all if the uh, economy is, as we think it is, going into um, a, a recession, uh, an elongated recession, and, and the stock market into a bear market. Okay. Yeah, so, so, I mean, you talked about how debt is bad, but savings is good, right? I mean, savings is up. Savings is, is, is good, but um, it's- And company, companies, some companies are just, you know, bathing in cash. We know Berkshire Hathaway is, <laughs> you know, and, and other, other I mean, that's an investment company, so it's a little different, but, but you know, they, they've got tons of cash on the sidelines, which, by the way, would make me think that Warren Buffett kind of believes in what you guys are saying to some extent, 
uh, and is waiting for a, a stock buying opportunity. But um, when you look at, uh, <laughs> I mean, when you, when you look at uh, uh, some of these companies, they're just so cash rich right now. It's unbelievable. That, that's correct. Yes. And, and uh, it's a great point because what, what we see here with the savings rate going up is the, is the, is the dash for cash. That is, that's not a bullish sign. That, that's um, over, in the long term, eventually the, the savings rate, the, the buildup of savings will be put to use. But in, whilst confidence is uh, on the wane, um, a higher savings rate has to occur as people become more interested in thrift, more interested in savings, uh, more interested or less interested in taking a risk. They want to save their money. They want to hold on to the cash. And of course, in, in a deflation, in a debt deflation, cash is king. People want to retain the cash to pay off their debts. Uh, and this is happening at a personal level as well as a, a corporate level. P uh, corporates aren't doing buybacks uh, and they're not, uh, they're scrapping dividends. And what's really from March, if you look at actually the constituents of the rally, now it's, it, people are looking at the like names as, as, as saying, well, um, you know, that looks like it's going to uh, be very bullish for the stock market. It, if you look under the hood there, it's, the companies like that that have the big cash piles, as you, as you correctly say. So, you know, Apple's awash with cash. And so it's the companies with strong balance sheets that have done well in this rally, which is a very subtle uh, reminder that the rally has been what we call corrective in nature. It's a defensive rally. Yeah, I wouldn't deny that. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay, so let, let's move on theme. Uh, and this shows, and we, you know, the Fed, the Fed should really take a good hard look at, at this chart because if the, one of the Fed's main goals is to have uh, price inflation, so they, they, they want to have the, the CPI uh, rate. Two percent. Uh, yeah, up. I, 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 I'm moving higher. Right. The, uh, the, Fed is, the Fed is a big believer in the Phillips curve. And the Phillips curve is the relationship between inflation and employment rate. And, uh, and you know, their belief is that if they target this 2% inflation, they'll have a satisfactory employment rate. But of course, there's a lot more to it than that. But why, why do you say the Fed should look at this chart? What is the, what's the big thing here? Well, it, it, because this chart tells, would tell the Fed that what they're doing is self-defeating. Okay, by, so the, the, the pink line here is what we call M2 velocity. And that sounds complicated, but it's actually very simple. It's just a measurement of um, the money stock relative to uh, gross domestic product. So it's gross domestic product divided by the amount of money in the economy. And so as the Fed print money, that ratio will go down, M2 velocity will go down. And, and as we can see, it's gone down a lot as the Fed has opened up the, uh, the printing presses recently and, um, uh, and it's gone down a lot. But what's interesting is that, uh, so we've got M2 velocity with a, a seven quarter lead against the core CPI rate. And as you see over the last 20 years, since the Fed started tinkering with monetary policy uh, and especially you know, since since '09, when they started really sort of printing money, uh, there's been a, there's been quite a stable relationship. So what this means is that the Fed might have printed a lot of money recently, but actually, if this relationship holds, then we can expect CPI, the, the CPI year-on-year -year rate, to tumble uh, over the next year or so. Um, and so this is saying that the Fed strategy, if the Fed is printing money, trying to get CPI up then it, this is self-defeating. Okay. So money printing will not create inflation. Is that the thesis? Well, it doesn't, it doesn't automatically have to lead to deflation. Uh, to no, do inf inflation. Yeah. yeah, it doesn't automatically have to, have to lead to inflation. It really de it depends on the time. And, and uh, 
So if the mood is one of a deflation, which we think it is now, then you know that money will just be hoarded. It won't be, it won't be spent. Um, in other times, there might be a, a difference and it will be spent and then you might have prices, uh, prices rise. But it, it all gets down to confidence and, and social mood. Uh, the, the, mere, the mere act of printing money itself, they can drop, and they are drop, you know, dropping money from, from helicopters. Oh, sure, yeah. We, we definitely live in helicopter course. bend era, for sure, yeah. 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 So, so, so are you are you saying then that Elliott Wave would would really be in uh, disagreement with Milton Friedman? Then, I mean, Harry Dent agrees with you. He doesn't think it's a monetary phenomenon. But Friedman said, you know, that inflation is everywhere and always a military phenomenon. Or yeah, military phenomenon. What am I thinking of? Um, a monetary phenomenon. And hey, monetary policy and military policy go together yeah. for sure. But uh, yeah. Uh, but but would Elliot Wave really disagree with Milton Friedman then? Well, what Friedman was really uh, referring to there was the the connection between the the the, the stock of money, uh, the amount of money in the economy, and and the level of prices in the economy. And uh, our view of history is that um, there is that what they call the quantity theory of money that has a quite an unstable relationship. So it doesn't have to be a one on one. A situation. What Friedman would say is that you create all this money and then it leads to higher prices, you decrease the money and it leads to lower prices. Um, it often happens like that. Uh, we think that it doesn't, it doesn't have to. Prices uh, in the economy, consumer prices, just a price uh, over many different cycles for many, many different reasons. Look at the price of um, technology over the last 20 years. That's been in a massive deflationary cycle. Um, you know, whereas perhaps in a war situation, when you have shortages, prices will go up. So it's, it's not, you know, automatically a quantity theory of money aspect. Now let, let's go on. Um, th th this is another reason we're thinking maybe deflationary uh, as well. This shows the bond, uh, what we call the bond universe, which is the Bloomberg mm -hmm. Barclays Global Aggregate Index. So this is essentially all the bonds in the world, treasury bonds, go mm -hmm. uh, all the government bonds in the world, okay. all the, all the semi-government bonds, the agency bonds, and all the corporate debt as well, emerging markets, junk bonds, everything loaded into this, this one uh, yield. Um, mm -hmm. And it looks like it may have completed or, or if it hasn't already completed, it's very close to completing a long-term ah, yields. Murray, Murray, we just, we, we are losing you once in a while. Um, okay. And we just kind of lost, no, 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 it's nothing you're doing. It's the internet. Don't worry right. about anything down there uh, okay. with your microphone or cord or anything. But um, we, we just lost you a little bit. Can you just repeat that last sentence there? Do you remember what you said? You're talking about bonds. Sure. And so, so this bond universe uh, consists of all the bonds in, in the world, whether they're government bonds. We heard agency, that. Yeah. Yeah. Agency bonds. And so we think looking at this chart that the, um, the, the cycle is, is almost complete. In other words, that the, the, the entire bond market, if you lump everything in together, is due for a rise in yields. So, you know, people say, well, well that, how can that be? Because the, the Fed, everyone's going to keep uh, interest rates pen, uh, pegged at, uh, at zero and, uh, you know, sovereign bonds, government bonds, will, 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 yields will remain low. Yes, they might, but uh, in a debt deflation, you will have uh, corporate bonds imploding. And that means that, that corporate uh, debt yields will, will move a lot higher. And we're, also, we're already seeing uh, some signs of that in, in the lower quality end of the bond market. If you look at the triple C rated uh, junk bonds, they've started to be uh, to underperform over the last few weeks from the triple A sector. So it certainly looks like the, the credit uh, implosion is coming through. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, the bond market is uh, definitely a complicated thing. There's no question about it, but okay. 
And just, just to show uh, a non-US chart, this is the, a chart of the uh, European stock market. Mm -hmm. And you, you say to, if you say to someone, well, the European stock market, is, Europe's been in a bear market for 20 years. You know, they might not believe you. Japan, uh, sorry, uh, obviously Japan's been in a bear market, you know, since 1989. Sure. And um, China has been in a bear market, if you look at their stock market, since 2007. So America, the US stock market has really been the holdout uh, up until now. But this chart of the uh, Eurostox index is really interesting from an Elliott Wave point of view because it shows that the, uh, uh, when confidence was really high back in 1999, uh, the euro was launched uh, and then the stock market peaked out. What this pattern is in Elliott wave terms is what we call a triangle uh, for obvious reasons, uh, which consists of five waves, an A wave, B, C, D, and E. Now it looks like we're just starting the E wave down here uh, now, uh, this year. Uh, and so that, that, that means two things. It means that yes, we're going to have a severe bear market uh, over the next few months, probably. But also, um, and this is where we're not all doom and gloom, uh, you know, we don't have to be, uh, because we go, we're, we're led by the, the objectivity of the Elliott Wave principle. And what that means, at some point in the future, um, according to this pattern, if it doesn't, if it holds, if this pattern holds and it doesn't make a new low past this, this uh, 09 low here, then this will be saying to us that actually Europe is might be uh, giving a, a really good long-term uh, buy signal. It's not happening now. It, we're still got a bear market to come, but when it's over, it could be the opportunity of a generation in Europe. Yeah, well, Europe is dying, sadly. So, you know, that's another problem. And hey, I was born in Europe. I think it's super sad to see what's going on in Europe, but Europe well, is- Well, that's right. It's had its bear market. Problem, if yeah. you think about it, it's already had a 20 year bear market. Yeah, you know, in the you know, of America, if the, if the Dow had not, if the Dow had peaked out twenty years ago, in fact, it had, it has. If you look at the the American stock market priced in uh, an honest currency, right? Mm -hmm. we, we can talk about uh, the dollar. And what would you be using? Gold? <laughs> I mean, gold. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Something that can't be printed. Right. right? Um, now. The Dow and the American stock markets priced in the honest currency right. of gold, they topped out in 1999. Yeah, and yeah. They're, they're still down 70% in gold terms since then. Yeah, so and you know, Peter, Peter Schiff said an interesting thing. And listen, I have my bones to pick with Peter Schiff. He's been on the show before and he's wrong a lot. But he, he, he does have some definitely witty, very logical things he says too. And um, you know, he, he, I've got a CNBC interview with him uh, that uh, we, we've looked at a lot where he says that uh, the returns from the stock market, and I think he's talking about the S&P, I don't know, maybe the Dow, I'm not sure which one, but he says uh, from about, uh, from, fr from 1932 uh, to, I think, uh, or maybe he's 29, I don't remember exactly, but, but like a 70 year period, 80 year period, basically they've been dividends, that's it. Adjusted for inflation, nobody's ever made any money in the stock market for seven decades, eight decades even. Um, and, uh, and that's, that's pretty interesting. So when you talk about the honest currency, I agree. Let me ask you about that. Would Elliott wave people be gold bugs? In terms of whether you're referring to whether we're, uh, you know, always I mean, do you, do you believe in precious metals? Do you like metals? Well, Sounds we, like, we like metals at the, at the right time um, okay. because they're, they're driven by, you know, human herding behavior the same as, as any other market. Okay. Is. What, about, what about cryptocurrencies? Again, we, we don't have uh, Elliott Wave practitioners, true Elliott Wave practitioners will not have a, a, a structural view. It's driven by what the uh, human herding behavior, what the Elliott Wave patterns are telling us uh, okay. at the time. Okay. Um, now it's interesting you mentioned gold because if we just skip forward, this is our this is the gold uh, chart that we're looking at at the moment, and so at the moment we're we're really in the minority in terms of what they're looking for gold. Everyone else in the world, it seems, is bullish of gold, um, but we are identifying the, uh, the 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 top in uh, 
you know, back here in 2008, uh, was, was the top in, in gold. And uh, since then, we've seen what we call wave A down. This is wave B up, which is going up to the start of wave A. So it's what we call a, a flat correction in uh, Elliott wave terms. What, but what happens next, if this pattern is correct, is that gold falls. Uh, and it falls quite sharply over the next few months. Um, and so that is really in the minority of what uh, people are saying. So it, from this point of view, we're definitely not gold bugs at this point. Okay. Uh, interestingly, we were, Elliott Wave International was back here in 1999 uh, when, when everyone else was uh, selling gold and, and central banks were selling gold. At the moment, you've got central banks coming back into the gold market. And again, like to, to your point of earlier, government, central banks, they're always last to the party. So it's another reason why we think that it's the time that, uh, to take a different tack on gold at the moment. And uh, based on the Elliott Wave pattern, that would seem to be correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I know Harry Dent's been predicting the uh, demise of gold for a long time. And then Peter Schiff's on the opposite end and he's wrong too. And, you know, he says, I remember in 2008 seeing Peter Schiff on in an interview saying, gold will be $5,000 an ounce by the end of Obama's first term. Well, Peter, uh, that was scary how wrong that prediction was. <laughs> but uh, hey, listen, the prediction business is dangerous business. So I'll give him some slack for that. It, yes, it, it, it certainly is. It certainly is, and, and this is why we. The best thing about the early wave principle is that it keeps us humble, you know, because uh, you know we're we're driven by what the market tells us is happening, and so you have to look at the the the, the data every day. It was actually uh, the Economist, uh, Keynes, who said that when the facts change, I change my mind. So, human herding behavior changes every day, and so that's why we evaluate the probabilities on new data that comes in uh, every day and make adjustments uh, after that. Okay. So, yep. Okay, well, let's, let's kind of wrap this up. I think you've maybe got one more chart to share. Do you or not? Or are we done with all the charts? Uh, no, we can, we, can, yeah, we can finish it there if you want, uh, okay. Jason. Okay, sounds good. So, so wrap up just everything for us. And, and one thing, well, maybe before you do that, um, I, I'd like to ask you, Murray, um, your school of thought is a deflationary school of thought. And I'm guessing you're talking about stocks deflating. I think maybe you're talking about consumer prices deflating. Um, but what do you think about, and, you know, stocks would be in the asset category, but, you know, we noticed uh, many times a, a big uh, divergence between asset inflation and price deflation. But then, you know, right now, I mean, I just read an article that, that groceries were at their five decade high adjusted for inflation. I mean, five decade high prices in groceries. Um, how do we make sense of this? Well, certainly, the, the, like I mentioned earlier, there are, if you look at the consumer prices, they, they will change depending on certain supply and demand, supply chain issues uh, that are going on. And, and obviously, there has been disruption recently with supply chains. And that's why we're seeing, you, you could be seeing big uh, increases and decreases in, in, in certain prices of goods uh, you know, at the moment. Um, but you know, certainly we think of uh, uh, inflation and deflation as very much a, a monetary and debt you know, phenomenon. It, it's all about debt, which is all about confidence. And so um, as the world deflates, and we think that uh, perhaps eventually this period will be known as the great deflation, the great debt deflation, then what you will find what we should find is that most assets fall, at least initially. Now, if we, we look at the, uh, we haven't got the chart here, but the, the chart of the uh, CRB index, the commodities index, um, you know, that's, that topped out back in 08. And so that's been in a bear market for 12 years already. Um, in Elliott Wave terms, it looks like it's got more uh, declines to come but what, that, what, what it also means is it should bottom out earlier than other asset markets, if our thesis is correct. So what we might find is that 
in the next couple of years, we might find that consumer uh, prices might start to bottom, which would be you know food prices or or uh, you know other uh, product prices in that regard, whilst asset prices are still uh, deflating. So it's really driven by the Elliott waves, which always gets down to uh, looking at uh, human herding behaviour and confidence. The thing, the thing is though, is that governments and central banks, they just abhor deflation. They just will not let it happen. And, you know, no matter what, you can, at least so far seemingly, print enough money to stop deflation. You know, you, they, there's an unlimited resource they have, and I know it makes no sense. It's a, you know, they can just kind of defy gravity. It's, it's ridiculous. It shouldn't be this way, but it is, you know, and, and so, uh, you know, that, that's why it's, it's hard for me to, to agree with some of the Elliott Wave things because I just know that these forces of governments and central banks are so powerful that I, I just want to, you know, follow on their coattails, even though I disagree with what they do a lot of times, well, most of the time, <laughs> frankly, but, uh, you know, I, I just know how much power they have. And, you know, if, if, if they hate deflation and inflation is part of their business plan to destroy the value of the debts they owe, then they're going to create inflation <laughs> come hell or high water, I think. I don't know. Maybe I'll be wrong, but thoughts? Well Sure. And I, I just refer back to this chart. Th this chart here shows that the more money the Fed prints, the more CPI, price inflation, will come down if, if this relationship holds. It might not hold, but it certainly is, it's held for the last uh, 20 years since the Fed started doing uh, tinkering around uh, more right, but, but you've had a, you've had a major technological boom and technology is deflationary you've had a globalization boom and globalization is massively deflationary um and then the other thing the chart just can't tell us is what i always talk about which is compared to what you know uh that goes back to the sherlock holmes uh statement of you, you know you can't hear the dogs that don't bark and, and the question is, how much different would it have been had the actions not occurred or had they occurred in a greater quantity, right? So if there was no money printing, what would have happened? And what if there was more money printing, what would have happened? We don't know. Nobody knows. It's impossible to know, right? Well, that's another great point because... Um, on deflation.com, uh, we have a, an article on there about the severe recession in the early 1920s in uh, the US, just after the Spanish flu pandemic, funnily enough. Uh, the US went into a severe recession, and pretty much like what's happening now. Um, and guess what the, the government and central bank did? Absolutely nothing. In fact, they, they, they tightened policy. They tightened fiscal policy. Um, and what happened? The economy recovered really quickly because the, 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 the market forces took their toll. It was Schumpeterian creative destruction. Uh, and that allows the economy to recover uh, you know, quicker. Hey, and you won't get any argument from me. You know, I say, uh, let Joseph Schumpeter rule, let creative destruction happen, um, let the bad companies get weeded out, let those people start again and do something better. Uh, no question, that's the way it should be. Uh, <laughs> we, we agree on that for sure. All right, wrap it up for us. We got our, we got our, we're going long, obviously, but this has been a very interesting discussion. So yeah. just wrap it up and, and give out your website. Well, you did deflation.com, right? Sure. Well, you can find us on uh, uh, elliotwave.com, deflation.com, socioeconomics.net. And, and don't forget uh, um, Robert Prechter's uh, updated book, Conquer the Crash. Mm -hmm. Good stuff. Good stuff. Uh, Marie, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much, Jason. Been a